You couldn't hear any of that, could you? Oh, wonderful. Um, okay, sorry about that. Uh, here we go. Welcome, Adol. So, you guys probably couldn't hear anything that I was saying for a bit, could you? Uh, no, sorry about that. Alright, so... Fun, I'll have to edit the stream afterwards. The Basically, what I was saying was that we're back. This is stream number three. We're going to be going through this, the project that I've been hired to write. Uh, quick re uh, recap of everything I was saying while my mic was off is as a kind of uh, recap on what we've missed. Um, I was hired to score a play, not a musical. It's a play. So it's a play out in New York, and they want a soundtrack like a movie has, which has its own unique challenges and issues that I've had to overcome, but it's a lot of fun. And right now, I'm at the fray stage where I've got most of my thematic ideas sketched out. And with the rapidly approaching deadline, I need to start making arrangements for these. Now, I was asked specifically to work with a hybrid score. So that means synths and acoustic instruments, uh, which is fun but new. I've never really worked with synths before, not extensively. So it's been a lot of fun learning how to create synthesizer sounds. Um, and yeah, it's just been a new kind of journey for me. So uh, let's, this one right here, the great line is the cue that I'm focusing on today. So this is kind of a sense of wonder, building adventure. This is kind of the moment where the characters realize that the adventure they're on is a little more than they anticipated. So let's listen to the piano sketch real quick. And then we'll just kind of pick up where I've been at and continue working. where we are getting simpler and simpler with each measure until the very end where there's going to be a small hint at another character's motif. So all in all, I'd say it's like two and a half, three minutes long. So this is what I'm working on today. I'm trying to create... Um, a more of an arrangement here. So I've got a process that I follow. I'm not going to explain all of it just yet, probably because we're going to go through it again in a moment. But essentially, I am going section by section. And I have broken this music into four sections. The first section are these first 12 or so measures, where it's the intro, right? Not a lot of, mater uh, not a lot of material. It's completely meant to be ambient. There's no motifs, no themes that need to be important later in the story. I just need to transition from zero music to suddenly lots of music. So to do this, throughout this entire play, my sound palette consists of just a few different options. I'm gonna be working with uh, piano. I'll allow myself to work with an upright bass, 
bowed and plucked. Um, I'm kind of on the fence about the cello. We'll see. Um, I I want the bass. The bass is definitely what I want in terms of like that's the instrument I want to work with. Uh, if there are moments where I need to go too high for the bass, I'm toying with the idea of a cello, but I'm going to try and avoid that. Uh, just because hiring more musicians gets more expensive. Uh, bass synth, uh, and then yeah, so I'm going to use piano, acoustic bass, synthesizers, and the human voice. So I can record myself singing, doing some humming, create a choir out of myself, all that kind of cool stuff. Um, but yeah, so what I'm working with so far is I've got this bass patch that I've created using Massive. Kind of a very subtle, kind of shifting low bass. It's meant to be subtle, but add some weight to the sound. And so I've got that recorded already, or like the MIDI ad data. And then the acoustic bass over it. Now the mix isn't quite good because I'm right now I'm just kind of getting to the point of writing my ideas down. And then I have the piano kind of added in. idea of the bass going down because again the bass is going to be a very important instrument for this soundtrack um, in fact I plan on having the bass actually play the melody a couple times um, unfortunately it just doesn't seem to go well with this synthesizer when it doubles so what happens if I just cut that and drop that an octave Let's try that, shall we? Unmute the piano. feels like a large jump I could try a bit more portamental which means like kind of gliding from one note to the other eventually that's what I want in the bass I want just a nice in the acoustic bass um, unfortunately my library cannot deliver that my library for whatever reason has a legato patch for every instrument in the Spitfire solo strings other than the bass. So you go to legato patches. Ooh, look at that. Two violins, viola, two celli, no bass. So that's a big bummer. Um, economic light resources, time machine. Yeah, unfortunately, I just don't have it. So this is why another reason I want to hire an actual bass performer, which will be provided generously by Musaversal. So I'm super excited to be working with them. Um, let's see here. What if I just do one of these? I like 
that. This base is a little quiet for my liking. Let's just raise this up. My initial level is 73. That is about mezzo forte. Add 20 on that. So that's 93. Could I got no go higher? Ah, yes, I cannot go higher, unfortunately, because I got a little carried away on this end. Let's just even that out a little bit. Let's go up to about 90. We'll say that's good. Ah, thank you, chat, and welcome. Welcome to the chat. Sorry for not seeing that sooner. As usual, if you guys have any questions, comments, ideas, theories, suggestions, anything at all, please throw them in the comment section. Um, I have a couple announcements about the channel that I'll be sharing in a few minutes. First, I want to figure out what's missing from this. do one of these shall we uh one second let's get louder before we get quieter let's do the same so modulation a little exaggerated don't need it going quite that high on either of these but I like the idea the general idea of getting louder before coming back down Close enough. And like I said, this isn't the final product. I'm just trying to get my ideas down. So something that's missing from this is I want a little bit more higher end. And in particular, I want something a bit more shimmery. So if you've seen my Hollywood cliches series, uh, where I basically do a bunch of templates for how do you get this kind of feel? How do you get that kind of feel with your orchestration? Oh, I wish this was orchestral. I feel much, much more confident in my ability to write for orchestra. If I was arranging this for an orchestra, I'd know right off the bat, Boom, I could have this done in an hour or two tops with a realistic mock-up. But because I'm working on synths, and that is something very new to me, it took me about like three hours to settle on this sound that I created. Uh, I went through a lot of different variations, a lot of different uh, versions of the synth. Sorry, my chair is on a cord. Um... But yeah, so it took a while. So it's this is slowing me down. But I am loving working with these sounds. Real quick, I'm going to remove the cello because I'm not using the cello. But okay, so my idea here is I kind of want a ringing sound uh, up here. I kind of want like a bell almost. So I'm going between D major and A minor mostly. Um. Let's see. Let's check and see if they've got any uh, welcome. Uh, awesome. Wonder, wonderful to see more people joining. Uh, let's see here. So I need a preset. Let's check and see what presets they have. Uh, I want a bell. Anything that says bell in it. Arctic bells. And of course it helped if I unmuted that track. That initial sound is nice. Let's see if I can find something. Uh, piano, keys, organ, synth, lead, guitar, percussion, male instruments, bow strings. Let's try percussion. Uh, percussion, conga, cowbell, timpani, other percussion. I just, no, none of these are working. Synth, pad, maybe? Basic pad, right pad, dirty pad. Um, no. Let's see here. Mallet instruments. Let's try bells here we go 
sequence. Loot. What's this? Ooh. No. No. Not at all. That's not what I'm looking for. You know what? We're going to have to build it from our, from scratch ourselves. Shall we? Oh, this is terrifying. Um, But I want something like that original. What was that one we had? Like Arctic Bells? I like this idea. I like the original. Where is it? Arctic Bells. I want something like that. Something... Alright, so... Now you guys get to kind of see my approach to planning synths. Because I'm very new to this. I'm going to have it right here. After one scene with the Great Lion, I have one that I planned out. That's the sub bass. Let's go with... Number two. It's going to ringing bells. All right, so ringing bells. Let's see where's my process down here. All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want to kind of describe my synth. All right, my musical function is what I talk about it. Then I have, I've kind of sorted synths into five basic categories. Just because I come from an orchestral background, I prefer when there are kind of functions to sounds. I would have to be a lot more comfortable with electronic music to become more familiar with the uh, typical uses of synths and like dance music and sound design and such. But because I'm not familiar with all that, what I'm trying to do is play to my strengths. And my strengths are writing for orchestral music. As such, I've kind of broken up these five different roles. All right, so the first one is a melodic synth. All right, so for this, the idea is if I want it to be a melody-purposed synth, it's going to be monophonic, meaning that it's only going to play one note at a time because most melodic instruments in the orchestra can only play one note at a time. Think of the trumpet, the clarinet, French horn. Stringed instruments can play more than one instrument uh, note at a time, but if they're playing the melody, they'll typically just play one. So uh, then the other thing for the melody is I'm going to need to be able to manipulate things in real time. So like for pitch, I need to be able to add vibrato. Timbre, I need to be able to change the tone color depending on how hard I hit it and stuff. Kind of, I want to treat it like an expressive instrument. For the bass, which is what I was working on before, my main thing was it had to be, again, monophonic because most bass instruments play only one note at a time, um, and a fast attack. Then chordal accompaniment, the main idea here is it's supposed to uh, support rhythmically and harmonically. So multiple notes at a time, that's what polyphonic means, and fast attack time, that means it needs to be, I need to hit the note like a piano, and you immediately hear it. So with the piano, there's a nice, no, not, uh, the moment I hit the notes, you hear it. There's not this long, uh, for example, on the acoustic bass, with the, I could do something like, where I come gradually. That's not usually the case with something that needs to be rhythmic. Uh, so percussion, something non-pitched, very quick attack, immediate decay, and then textual is very similar to chords, but I can, it's not so much about rhythmic, more about harmonic and color. Uh, so that's a quick explanation of how I personally try to make sense of all this stuff. So if we go back to the ringing bells, I'm gonna take some notes and just try to figure this out. So the first one is musical function. All right, so let's delete this so I can see the top of it again. Um, I want to describe it. So I want this, so essentially I want this to be a pedal tone. I want this synth to function as a pedal tone. Something, if I can spell something right, playing above the other sounds. That sounds a bit like a ringing Bell, something like a glockenspiel playing tremolo. All right, so that's kind of the sound I want. So for this kind of sound, this is going to be more kind of textural, all right? It's not going to be percussion because it's going to be pitched. Um, and... Again, all of these I can kind of adjust as I go. 
I could also say that it's chordal accompaniment, right? It needs to be rhythmic and fast, but I'm thinking more textural. Um, slow attack on mostly because I want... So I'll say this is going to be... It will be a combination of textural slash chordal. I want it to primarily add color and texture to the sound, but I also to um, sound a little, uh, uh, I wanted to, to have a uh, morphing quality over time. All right, so let's see here. After that, next step is sound characteristics. All right, so I need to basically answer these questions. And again, all this just helps me think it through. I'm not really trying to teach anything right now. This might be something that helps you. It might be something that doesn't help you. Uh, maybe you're more of a music producer than an orchestrator, unlike myself, and seeing me do this is driving you crazy. Um, but personally, I just don't have this come naturally to me, so I have to rely on a system. Sound characteristics. So let's say pitch. Let's put this here. Let's unhighlight that. Let's do this. Just kind of like to keep everything neat and tidy. All right, uh, welcome, 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 everybody. Perfect, let's see here. Um, uh, Florian, the Arctic Bells sound really nice. Maybe too much delay, though. Right, um, same here, like EDM and stuff, but I haven't dug deep into it enough, so I approached sense more creation perfect. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you, Tim. Sorry, and thank you, Florian. Right, so, Florian, I agree. I, I really enjoy the sound of the Arctic Bells. The problem... I'm having it. So maybe we could just try manipulating it. If I already like the sound, here we go. It would help if I was on the right one. See, okay, so things I like, I like that initial attack, that initial, and kind of the delay that comes after it. Whereas the delay is like the echoes. What I don't like, okay, so what's envelope three attached to? So we're looking for blue things, so three. So the but let's attach to the, to this filter here, a double notch filter. I got the delay, got the track. The thing that I have an issue with is if I hold down the note, Okay, well, first, I was going to talk about how it doesn't keep ringing, like you keep striking it more times. But now I'm noticing that pipe noise is really annoying. Um, Let's see here. What's the pipe noise? Is that wind? There's. I love the chime sound, so we'll probably use this as inspiration. Um, But for the most part, I want to try and... Let's see here. So uh, I, I, they're just, it doesn't fit perfectly. So I need to, I want to at least try to make my own. All right. So pitch, couple questions to consider. Is this instrument pitched or non-pitched? All right. So it, this instrument, basically these are the questions I want to answer. Uh, the synth needs to have definite pitch, something nice and crisp like a bell. All right. I spelled definite wrong. Apparently, maybe not. Uh, if it pays, what range does it have? Um, it doesn't need a big range, all right? So this isn't something I need to worry about so much. I basically just want to be able to hit this note. Uh, like a high A or something. Um, I want it to be precise and focused. I kind of noticed that. Not smeared. So the idea of, like, um, in music, like, the idea of a smeared, a nice crisp attack is, like, trying to draw a shape using a sharp pencil versus using a dull pencil, all right? So some notes are very easy, some sounds, like a violin hitting a clear, crisp note with great intonation has a very focused sound. If you add a mute to that same violin, it kind of smears the sound, makes it a little less perfect. Again, like you're trying to draw with a dull, round pencil. You don't have as defined lines. It still does the job, it's still pitch, it still plays and stays in tune, it's just not as focused. Oh, let's see here. So, yeah. 
so I've got that. Nothing too much about pitch that I need to focus on. Let's, this, let's, I don't like how it has. There we go. That's better. I get a little particular with how neat my documents look. Oh, timbre. All right, so now I wanted to show. So I want this sound like a chime slash bell. Something like a glockenspiel being played uh, with tremolo. So like the idea of the same note being played over and over again. So if we get, if we pull up a, a glockenspiel sound library on contact, I can kind of share the idea I have in my head of what I want to create. Uh, tuned glockenspiel. There we go. Um, let's see here. Alistair, welcome back. Did you get a chance to listen to the recommended off piece to recommend on Tuesday? No, unfortunately not. It slipped my mind. I have it. I have it right here, written in my chicken scratch, right here amongst all my notes to listen to it. Uh, and I want to, uh, but I've just been so focused on trying to get all of this put together that it's kind of uh, slipped my mind, but I will listen to it, Alistair. Thank you for the reminder. But uh, uh, yeah, so sorry, sorry. I wish I could say I had listened to it. I w I'm looking forward to listening to it, but. All right, so that's the kind of sound I want to create. Um, Let's see if I can slow that down. No, I thought there was a way to. So I want to create something similar to that, but something with a little more control, something a little softer, a little muted, filtered, maybe. So worst comes to worst, I probably could just use that as a sample and then manipulate the sound itself. Uh, but, oops, wrong button. Where did, oh, did I exit out of my notes? There we go, control shift T saves the day. It brings back my uh, document. All right, so Tim, I want this to sound like a chime or bell, sound like a gosh, I'll be played with tremolo. Um, so here's a couple different ideas. Um, what kind of tone color? Uh, um, this instrument will probably need to work with a bit of noise in the sound, and preferably oscillators with non-harmonic partials. All right, so the idea here is when you're working with a synthesizer, noise is a pre-recorded sound. It's a, well, not always. Sometimes it's like uh, white noise, pink noise, brown noise. There's all kind of like static type sounds. Uh, and sometimes they are recordings, like water bubbling or people talking. The idea is these are more organic sounds. And you can use those organic sounds to make your synth sound a little more acoustic if you know what you're doing, which I don't. I kind of know what I'm doing, enough to fumble through and create some sounds. But hopefully, given enough time, I will get much more um, uh, in command of my synthesizers. Um, so if I want to try and emulate something like a bell, I should probably include some noise, some things like if we listen to that sound library of the glockenspiel being played as a tremolo, um, there is the sound of the bell, yes, but there's also the sound of the mallets hitting the bell. Uh, when you listen to a trumpet player or a flute player in particular, uh, there's the sound of the wind going through the instrument. Uh, for stringed instruments, you have the sound of the bow. There are all kinds of organic sounds that aren't prominent, but are part of the sound. So I want to try and capture some of that as well. Uh, and non-harmonic partials, um, meaning that they're not based off integers of the original pitch. All right, so for example, when I talked about the overtone series in previous videos, I talked about how if you take one note and you cut it in half, you divide by two. Half the length of that note um, is the sounds an octave higher, and these are the partials you hear that give a unique timbre. Non-harmonic partials do not go based off integers, maybe like 2.3%. Uh, or like divide by 2.3 kind of thing. Um, and those tend to all sound a little bit more crystal, more bell-like. And that's why instruments like the glockenspiel, uh, the vibraphone, the celeste have very similar sounds because they have a lot of 
these non-harmonic partials. Uh, again, I don't need to worry about how the sound changes across ranges and registers all that much because I'm not really going to be using that. Uh, loudness envelope. All right, this is where I'm probably going to have the most command of understanding how this sound needs to work. Just because there are something, there is something called a bell timbre in orchestration, where you imitate the sound of a bell elsewhere in the orchestra, um, and you do that largely using the loudness envelope. So that's the attack, decay, sustain, and release of the sound. Um, so this is a decaying instrument. A decaying instrument. All right, so it needs to be a decaying instrument, which means that, uh, for example, a piano is a decaying instrument. If I take a note and I hit a note on the piano, from the moment I hit the note, that note immediately starts dying back down to silence. On the acoustic bass, I can hold that long theoretically for as long as I need to. The note does not immediately start dying. Most bells are like the piano. You strike it, and then the sound immediately starts to die. So when I say I need this to be a decaying sound, that's what I mean. I mean that the moment it plays, there's a quick attack, transient. It's a called it an attack transient, the first hit. And then it starts coming down immediately. Some instruments, like the piano, can use a pedal and the amount of force you use to play it to lengthen how long it lasts. Uh, but it will ultimately decay. Whereas, like, the bass, those are called sustaining instruments. So I need this to be a decaying instrument. And strong attack, transient, with a very quick decay to a low sustain level. Possibly a bit of... Uh, so ADSR, what's the R stand for? Um, it's attack, decay, sustain, release. I don't know why it was so hard for me to remember that. Uh, attack, sustain, decay, attack, decay, sustain, release. So I've got that, uh, expressivity. So this is where it starts to get a bit more unique. What, how do I want to be able to make this more expressive? Remember the ability, the idea behind expressivity in music is your ability to change the sound. So on the piano, how hard I hit the note determines kind of the brightness and the volume of the sound. On a stringed instrument, the power I'm putting behind the bow does the same thing. How bright is the sound? How loud is the sound? Um, so essentially to create an expressive synth, you need to find ways to mimic this. How can you change the pitch by maybe vibrato? It's like a stringed instrument can do vibrato timbre does it get brighter all that kind of stuff so expressivity what makes this instrument uh, expressive pitch dynamic so i want the timbre to get a bit brighter as the velocity goes up i want the uh you know what Let, i'm just gonna I want, i'm just gonna name off a few things that i want to be able to manipulate i'm not gonna try to be too specific here right so I, Manipulate uh, brightness of the sound, panning, maybe volume. Um, and yeah, those are the three that I think I really want to focus on. So now the next step is essentially using all that instrument information to kind of use this as a backdrop for making it. So the step one is I want to start with my initial oscillators. Now this is where, um, oh, good question. Uh, Adol, is there any percussive instrument with a sustained sound? Um, yes, uh, it de because again, you gotta think that a percussion instrument can be essentially anything these days. Uh, so an example of a percussion instrument with a sustained sound could be the musical saw, all right? Where you are bowing a, thing, a saw, essentially a thin piece of metal to create the sound. You can also bow a uh, cymbal, which creates a very interesting, scraping, haunting, kind of scratchy sound. Um, and in theory, you could sustain it. It wouldn't be as easy or as clear, but it's possible. Not common, but possible. 
Um, let's see here. Is that percussion instrument? Uh, Shunk up a vibraphone or piano with sustains. Interesting point. Um, unfortunately, that's not sustained. A note can have a sh long decay. The piano can. Oop, that's not the piano. If I were to do a quick chord, that can have a long decay. But the idea behind a sustaining instrument is from the moment you hit the note, it will not decay. It will not die out entirely until you tell it to. For the piano, in order to get that sound, you need to essentially keep hitting those same notes to keep it from dying out entirely. So all idiophones and keyboard instruments, other than the organ, the organ is a sustaining instrument, but all idiophones and chordophones, I should say, which are things where you strike the sound to create the sound, anything you strike is almost always going to be a decaying sound because it dies. Uh, vibraphone is a beautiful instrument. So thank you, Sean, and that's uh, cool, Adol, that you hadn't heard about it. Um, let's listen to this one more time just so I kind of get the idea in my mind again. So not perfect yet, but I've got the basic sounds there. Let's start working on this ringing bell one. All right, I'm gonna always add a number one after it just because I don't know if I'm gonna create more. So we've got the Arctic bells. It's not perfect, but I like the initial sound. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, all of these yellow things basically mean that I can control this with a fader. All right, so number one, if I hold this note down, Ooh, all right, that was very unpleasant. Sorry about that. I have no idea what any of these do, uh, but I did just learn my lesson not to do that. Again, uh, let's see here. So we have an A. First, let's just start with the uh, oscillators. These are our raw sounds. So this is an additive mix two is the oscillator. Additive six is the second one. Uh, and they look like they are doubled and transposed, meaning that they play at the same time, but one is moved to a different pitch. Um, what's number seven doing? All right, so the intensity is being manipulated on offset too. I like that. Um, you know what? Here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna double this. And we are going to essentially just take what we like, reject what we don't, all right? New sounds, that was additive two. Ooh, I'm gonna lower the bottom. And then there was wavetable position around here, right? Where was the wavetable position for that? Um, okay, wavetable is actually over there towards that direction. No, why did I do that? Um, here we go. Let's put this over here. Oh, yeah, I like that. And this one was additive six, down five semitones, which means it's a perfect fourth below, which essentially means it's a perfect, the same note that would be perfect fifth above. So that's A and E. So that outlines the note. And then this one, where was this one? This one was wave table was all the way down. Intensity was up. I like that. I like that. All right, so that works. Um, let's see. So to create the sound, I'm probably gonna want some FM or phase synthesis or ring mod. These are used to help create a more metallic sound. Um, let's see what the settings are. 
on Arctic Bells first. So this is Arctic Bells. This one is, all right, so modulation is on. Ring mod is being applied to number one. Phase to number two. And then let's try that, all right? So let's see the ring mod, it's down. Ring mod is down all the way, but it changes. Let's see the performer six LFO. Let's see what kind of effect this has on it. Ooh. Let's just do one of these. Copy. Paste. Honestly, if I'm being honest, I don't. Oh, yeah, I gotta change this up two octaves. I don't really hear what this does. So, what if I turn it off? Alright, so let's see here. So I like the idea of having a short, so this is probably where we're going to be deviating from the original. First, let's create a bandpass filter. Kind of like that. Around there. Like that. What if we drag that over? Give a quicker attack. No sting. All right, so let's not use any ring mod. I kind of like the sound without it. Let's add a little bit of noise, shall we? Let's see here. What if we applied the same kind of thing here? Maybe there, all right. I'm being a little quiet, sorry everybody. Um. Let's see here, the big news. Um, awesome, yes, 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 so sorry, tremolo. Yes, tremolo is a fantastic strategy for getting more of a sustained sound out of your percussion. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Adol. Sorry, I've been a little quiet. You know what, to kind of focus on the stream a little bit, um, let's make a couple announcements. One is right now until uh, December 31st, so Saturday at noon, Eastern Standard, Standard Time. Uh, I'm having a raffle on the Instagram page, all right? So go follow me on Instagram, find my most recent post, which is about the raffle, and you tag two of your friends, make sure you follow the page, and on December 31st, noon Eastern Standard Time, I will be raffling off randomly three copies of my newest ebook, which is the Guide to MIDI Mockups. Essentially, all the information you need to know to take your sound libraries and make their performances sound much more realistic. I'm giving them away for free. All you got to do is follow the Instagram page and enter that raffle. Um, other than that, kind of the cool direction I'm planning on taking this channel, because in the last couple streams, we talked about how you guys want to learn more about the emotions of music. Uh, so in the coming year, I've realized I've done a lot of music kind of tutorials about music theory and orchestration stuff. I will finish the current orchestration series as soon as I can. But after that, I'm going to start pivoting away from uh, music theory tutorials so much about like, here's how you do a chord progression. Here's how you do all like orchestration, stuff like that. Since I have enough of that, I feel like I'm going to pivot towards more about the emotions of music. So essentially two types. Videos about the theory, essentially. Why does this music sound sad? What makes this soundtrack sound so emotional? Or essentially, what makes music sad? How, what makes music sound exciting, angry, all that kind of cool stuff. And then application-based videos. 
that it is like, how do you write sad music? How do you write music that sounds angry or scared? That kind of cool stuff. And focusing a lot more on emotions in music and not just the music theory side of things. So if that's something you guys are interested in, let me know. I'm toying with the idea. If no one's interested in that, I probably won't do it. I'll probably put out a poll soon. Uh, just figure out what people are looking for this year. But there seems to be so much interest in the idea of how to add emotion or create emotion with music that I thought, who knows, maybe I, I've, I know how to do that stuff. Uh, I love the psychology of music. Uh, I have my master's in social work for, all, for Pete's sake. I was studied to be a therapist before I committed to music. Um, and I don't get to use that degree all that often anymore, unfortunately. So I don't know. Let me know what you guys think. At this point, I'm kind of ran rambling again. But uh, let's get back to the work at hand. Let's see here. That's a bit too much noise. I like just a little bit. What if it's white noise? Let's see here. Ooh. That's it. Let's see here. Let's see here. It'll love it, Sean. Thank you. Sean Gavit. Sad equals minor with Apache Torres on the ninth. Yes, that is a very common strategy. So the idea behind what it, uh, Sean just shared are, of course, minor chords. And then the ninth is the Apache Torres, meaning that the technically the uh, second uh, is in the melody. So Sounds very emotional. So what if we go with, uh, let's go a little bit lower. And then, I don't know, I'm not feeling like, uh, but that's the fun stuff. Just kind of tips like that because the idea behind uh, music, I believe I've shared this before, is ba like you can approach it with different psychological models in mind. For example, the circumplex model of affect. Affect spelled with an A, not an E. The It's an older, somewhat outdated model for understanding emotions, but it applies very well to music, where the idea is that an emotional experience in and of itself is essentially gauged by two things. How positive or negative it feels, and then how much energy or tension it causes. So the happiness, like, so for example, contentment versus excitement. Both of those are positive. But contentment has very low energy. You're just kind of like at peace. Whereas excitement is positivity with high energy. So when applying that to music, you essentially find which aspects of music can be used to translate the degree of positivity versus negativity versus which strategies can be used to manipulate the energy. And of course, there are many strategies that bridge the gap between the two. So the idea is like, how do you create this toolbox of different tools across the nine parameters of music that I like to advocate so much and translate those to create music? So if you want to create nostalgia, understanding what is nostalgia to begin with. And then once you kind of understand where nostalgia falls on the, on the scale of like positive to negative, uh, versus the scale of energy. And there's a couple other parameters we can tackle in there too to create a more stable, useful model of emotion. Uh, but essentially, how can you understand emotions from that point of view and translate it into music to always write music that accomplishes the emotional goals you're looking for? So that's kind of the direction I'm thinking about this coming year is kind of rebranding the channel uh, away from just another kind of dime a dozen music composition channel where it teaches theory. Because at this point, I've released over a hundred videos, all right? So I've got a playlist on writing melodies. I've got a playlist on writing chord progressions. I've got multiple play playlists on orchestration. And there's a lot of other YouTubers out there who do this. So Ryan Leach, uh, uh, Rick Beato, um, all these, uh, a bunch of big, famous, very amazing channels that I am a fan of um, who do that kind of stuff. And I was thinking, well, what do I have to contribute? What do I have that's unique? And of course, it's my bachelor's degree in psychology and my master's degree in social work. And my background being trained to be a therapist. I understand emotions in a different way than many musicians do. And if I can share that perspective 
Uh, I think that'd be very helpful to a lot of people. So I'm excited to see that people are excited. If that's what you're interested in, let me know. I would be more than happy to kind of take that direction. Um, let's see here. Florian, I would love that most Harmony books that I come across ignore the emotional aspect. The only exception is probably Hollywood Harmony by Frank Lehman. Yes, I have that book on my shelf. It's a wonderful book. Very dry, very academic. Because, of course, it was written as a thesis. Uh, so, um, or something along those lines. It was written for an academic purpose. Uh, but, uh, yes, it does focus a lot on neo Raymanian theory. Uh, to explain why certain things sound emotional, which is a fantastic area of study. Uh, so that'd be fun. Um, yeah, I think not a lot of... That, that was the biggest frustration for me. That's why I designed a couple of the tools and videos I've shared already and written a couple of the books that I have um, is because when I was taking classes with Berkeley, there was a big focus on... It was like, well, here's how you create this emotion in music. And there wasn't enough focus... And it was all it was useful, very helpful. I don't want to bash it because that was certainly very helpful. But the idea was it was always music first, and it was always how do you write music, and that functions as the emotion rather than starting with the emotion first. And so that's what I kind of turn on the head. It turned on its head is this idea that to write truly emotional music, you have to understand what makes this emotion unique, what makes nostalgia unique from say melancholy. How do you get differences between those uh, kind of emotions and how do you portray them with the music kind of thing? Um, so, uh, Sean, honestly, the tricky part about emotions beyond the abstract subject part is that most guides on emotion focus on scale mode and orchestration versus voice leading texture and form. Yes, uh, that is true. Lots of them focus on almost entirely on harmony and sometimes orchestration. Uh, the orchestration books often have uh, some guides. I'm like, well, here's this, well, this instrument collection, it sounds like. Uh, Sean Gilbert, like, yes, scale and orchestration is a super salient element in emotion, but the main problem is that it makes a rather forced sound, which is oof. The two books I know for chromaticism such romantic period is Audacious Euphony and Hollywood Harmony. Awesome, thank you. I'm excited to try that out. Uh, Audacious Euphony, I haven't heard about that one yet. But I'm excited to try that in that book out, because I'm always looking for good books to read. Uh, but yeah, so that's just kind of like an exciting look into what's coming for the channel. Um, like I said, I'm focused, I'm thinking about dividing the type of contact in, uh, content into two categories. One where it's like the theory based, uh, videos, which is like, all right, what makes music sound emotional? And then there's the application videos, which are much more like, all right, so now we know what makes music sound emotional. How do we write music that sounds emotional? How do we apply these kind of things? Um, so that's my game plan moving forward, I think. Uh, let, let me know what you guys think. I'd love input on what you guys would like to hear. Uh, let's get back to trying to create this ringing bell. All right, so... The noise should be a little softer. Let's see here. So we've got kind of that going on. Let's add a bit of reverb. In fact, let's make sure we have the same reverb as the bass. And I cannot copy and paste on this one, so what's going on? Here we go. All right, what's going on here? Did I, oh, and I destroyed my reverb. Fortunately enough, this is why you always save once you've got a nice sound you like. Ooh, nope. That's why you also stick to the range you designed it for. Um, let's just look at the reverb then. All right, I'll have that on my other screen. Screen. Let's go reverb, dry or wet. This essentially determines how far do you does it sound like you're standing from your source. Size determines what the size of the room you're standing in. Density, I'm not going to toy with that. I'm just going to put that down there because that's what I have. And that's the base again. Sorry. I'm going to lift this up a bit. I'm going to bring the color down. I, I don't like that distinct doubling. Okay, so now what we're going to do, and I need to create some motion on this. What 
if I... Let's bring the amp down on this one. And let's add a little bit more. Because it had kind of something interesting going on with the performer, didn't it? Let's change this to a performer. Let's create something interesting looking. Uh, let's see here. Let's add this here. Let's put this up here. Kind of the idea here is that what I'm doing is I'm adding a little bit more variability to the sound. In fact, let's add same thing here. There we go. I like it. it. Sounds like a nice bell now. Let's do an LFO. For what we're gonna do, or maybe we'll do delay instead. What if we add just delay? So delay makes distinct. Uh, I don't know how do you work with delay in massive, unfortunately. So what we're gonna do is we're actually going to just change this from a. We're gonna change this from a decay to. A We're gonna change this from a decay to a sustaining instrument. We are going to add an LFO, which creates a repeating movement to the amp. Let's see here. Uh, let's see here. How do I? I want to add this to the amp, like the out volume. Oh, you know what? I'll do that over here. How do I do this? I want to create... Let's create something more... Almost there. I'm trying to create like a repeating ringing sound, like it's being struck multiple times. Um, let's see here. You know, things. Uh, let's see here. Um, Tamashi trying. Hi, Steven. Uh, sorry, I am Aditya. Oh, welcome back, Aditya. Uh, but I had to create a new account as my old one got deleted. I've been trying to recover it since. Of course, I remember you, Aditya. You were always one of the most, uh, you're one of the OGs of the channel. You've been following for a long time. You comment on a lot of the streams. You've been here for a long time. Um, it's wonderful to have you back. Sorry about your channel. That really sucks. Uh, but welcome back. Welcome back. Hopefully, Tamashi Trine. Hopefully, this one works well for you. Uh, so, welcome back. Sorry about to hear that. But, yes, of course, I remember you, Aditya. So, thank you. Thank you for coming back. So, on chat, GPT has also been super baller for asking a specific music question as well. Awesome. Uh, let's see. What's chat, GPT? Here's the bell. So I'm not sure... Not sure what that is, unfortunately. Sorry, Sean. I'm not following too long, but uh, I'm assuming they're another YouTuber, ChatGPT, unless that's slang. I don't know. Uh, I'm not really with it as far as slang goes. Uh, but uh, Florian, I tend to use non-diatonic chord progressions extensively in order to invoke certain emotions using neo-Romanian theory. Yes, that is very common. I I call them chord relationships. Um, lots of people do, but neo it's essentially neo-Romanian theory, where you're focusing more about how the individual notes uh relate to each other in chords. So I've talked about how my absolute favorite one is the minor triad separated by a major triad from a perfect fourth. In fact, this chord is the reverse of that. That's what this entire cue is based on. Um uh Tomashi, the past two months have been rough. My socials were hacked. That really sucks. And it's terrifying. Uh, it terrifies me to think about someone just taking the channel from me. That would be very heartbreaking. Uh, but, uh, yeah, hopefully you're getting back to everything. Sorry to hear that. 
Adichia, but, um, you know, welcome back, I guess. I, uh, not much I can say about that. I've, I got hacked once. Uh, it wasn't this. It was for a personal account. It was my Facebook account, actually. I don't get on Facebook that much anymore. Uh, so it's been a very long time since I've gotten on Facebook. But when I did have a Facebook, it was like the beginning of Facebook Marketplace, and someone hacked it, and they put a whole bunch of stuff for sale on my account, like thousands of things, and then closed all the sales. So I was getting a whole bunch of messages from random people asking if things were still for sale, and then I ended up getting kicked from Facebook Marketplace for not making good on my deals or whatever. It was frustrating, but I was able to resecure the account. Uh, Florian, Sean Gilbert, ChatGPT is great, but often it gives wrong answers, especially when it comes to voice leading and modal scales. It's an AI chat. Oh, oh, awesome. Thank you. All right, that's cool. Uh, an AI chat. That'd be cool. Um, I got approached by someone recently about working with an AI series of videos. Uh, it was a friend of mine uh, who's got the idea of using like one of the AI generators to write lyrics and then just having different musicians take their crack at writing a song or music to those lyrics, uh, which I have mixed feelings about. I think it'd be really fun, really cool, but I am a little guarded towards the idea of AI being involved in music. Um, um, awesome. So yeah, it just seems like a cool idea. Let's see where we are now. All right, we're, we're trying to create a ringing bell. I want... The idea of... I want... Not so much of that. I want more of a... I kind of want the idea of it being performed multiple times. I want to really like reset the attack of my sound. If only there was a way to kind of like loop this initial sound. I wonder if there is. I'm sure there is. I just don't know it. Uh, let's see here. Because I want to kind of repeat this idea. How do I get a stronger attack on this? What if I attached it to the cutoff as well? Is there a way to make this one directional? Oh, preset user, say so mono. Is that what mono does? No. I don't know. As you can see, I'm still very new to these. So let's remove that. It might just be delay. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, let's listen to this again real quick. So I like the idea. Okay, so these ringing bells. So I love the sound of Arctic bells for the initial attack. Why can't I get it to... All right, first, what is... I want multiple attacks on this. What if the 
let's see here. What am I doing here? I want to raise that an octave. Is it the sound that's causing issues? Is that noise? A little bit. What was that? Shoot me. Huh. I don't know. This is why I have a love-hate relationship with synthesizers. It's because I'm new to them. Uh, I am being expected to do professional work with tools that I don't understand entirely. Oh well, but it's life to life. If I want to keep this job, I just got to get good at it. What if I just kind of do that? Like, I love this sound. What if I just use Arctic Bells, use the preset, here we are. What if I do one of these? Bring it down to 16. all down create a shape with the velocity I actually don't know if velocity is attached in this one. <sighs> no I like the sound but it's not it doesn't have the kind of rhythm I'm looking for I want a kind of a an idea of like a ringing bell something a chime um, let's see here. Um, uh, let's see here what's the composition about. Ah, yes, it is alternative to Google, but it's much clearer to get no help answer. Uh, yep, very nice. Uh, yeah, I, I have to give this a try. I have to give this AI a try, see what, what it's like. Uh, Shanghai, so look, I want to get Centurial, looks like you need to. That's the thing. I have Centurial, and I learned so much from it. The problem is. I learned all of it in like a week, like last week. So I definitely wasn't able to follow my own advice of going slow with it. Um, so I have a lot of theoretical knowledge in my head. I just don't have the experience of applying it. So it's kind of like orchestration. When you start out, you can have a lot of theoretical knowledge of what how instruments work theoretically. But then the more experience you get, you're like, all right, so that's what it actually sounds like when a flute plays in this register. Uh, kind of thing. And that's what I lack is the experience so far with synths. Mark my words. Three months from now, I will be fantastic at creating synths. It's just initially for this first idea. Let's see here. So I love this sound. But what if... I apply. Is six being used anywhere? Yeah, six is being used here. Uh, is five being used anywhere? Doesn't look like LFO five is being used anywhere. So let's try applying it. Oh, wait, it is because six is applied here. Where is. Oh, I don't know. I just love the idea of having like a ringing bell sound. Um, if any of you are familiar with Attack on Titan's theme, or like not theme, the OST, Call of Silence, there is a bit of me. There is this ringing sound that I that is really inspiring me for this piece. Do you want to grow your YouTube channel? You should consider I getting do. Too Thank buddy. you. I've been using Targeted Too Buddy ads. for the last. But I'll pass. This is a beautiful piece and I highly recommend it. But for now, like that just that one idea of like the the ringing bell is what's just got an idea in my head for. 
So let's see here. So what if we do one of these? Put this up seven. What if we go up an octave? Kind of like that. Um, and more skills in that department. Ping pong delay would be, ping pong delay would be really nice. Um, uh, I thought about that. I say the idea is, you know, I'm just have to learn how to use it. Like ping pong delay. So there's delay, delay synced. Yeah, ultimately, I'm just gonna have to look up in the manual how to use uh, the different types of delay on this sound. So let's actually do that, shall we? Um, actually, you know what? Let's try Centorial. Centorial usually has really great tutorials right in it. Let's open it, shall we? So you guys can see a little bit of what Centorial looks like. I highly recommend it. I learned so much from uh, Centorial. It's just the idea of uh, I haven't had enough time to apply it and master it. Let's see, making it sound metallic noise, high lows, dirty up your sound, different kind of metallics worth repeating with more control. That's going to be LFOs. Let's see here, brightness, volume, press it. Which one? Ah, echoes, delay, massive delay. Let's see what he has to say. Massive oh, delay. delay. Over here in the effects section, we've got two delays, delay and delay synced. We're going to start with delay synced because it's the most similar to Centorial. First things first, I'm going to crank this damp knob and come back to that in a second. Our dry wet knob is like Centorial's mix knob and it's set to 50-50 by default. You can bypass the effect up here by turning this light off. Over here we've got the feedback knob, and just like Centorial, that determines how many delays we're going to get. Turn it all the way down and we get one delay. All the way up, and it doesn't go on infinitely like Centorial's does, but we do get a lot of delays. Mm -hmm. Now our time is set over here. We've got boxes instead of a knob. And we're allowed to set the delay time of our left channel separate from our right channel. Now, Centorial, like this delay, is also a stereo delay. A stereo delay generates a delay in both the left and right side, but they're happening at exactly the same time. So we just hear it as one delay down the center. But Massive gives us separate time controls over our left and right side, which can allow for some interesting rhythmic effects. So the way these time boxes work is essentially you divide the top number by the bottom number, and that gives you your rhythmic value. So one over four, one divided by four, that's a quarter. So we have a quarter delay in our left and right side. Listen to how Massive's delay is nice and wide, as opposed to just being down the center. Let's set it to eight on the bottom. Now we have an eighth on both sides. Set it to 16. And we have a 16th. Now let's say we want to set the right to a different value, an 8th. Now we're going to get a sort of bouncing left and right effect. So by combining different time values, we get really cool, complex delay rhythms. Now we can also use these time controls to create delay rhythms that fall in between beats. For example, I'm going to set this down to 8, and I'm going to set the top number All to right, 3. Alright, so you're starting to getting a little bit more advanced than I need right now. I might come back. But this is essentially what I've been doing, making all these synthesizers. I get ideas in my head, and then when I get stuck, I revisit Centorial. Because the nice thing about Centorial, I am not sponsored by them. I wish I was. They are an incredible product. And I heard they recently updated. So I, I'll probably save up to see if I can get the update. Uh, but they have, they go through like the theory of like, okay, not necessarily the physics of what delay does, but why would you use delay? Uh, in this case, often there are like three basic rules. One, you can use it to create a doubling effect. Another, you can create kind of rhythmic effects. And the third, you can create echoing 
ideas. Uh, those are the three basic uses for delay. And then the last video of each of them is kind of a targeted video for the type of synth, synth that you're working with. I chose Massive because that was the option available that I owned. So that's what I'm working with. So let's try, now that I know how to use the Arctic Massive, or like not Arctic, I saw Arctic Bells. Now that I know how to use Massive's delay, let's try So we'll go dry, but that's basically the idea of how loud are the doubles. This looks, okay, here we go. As I say, this looks different than the one he was working with. Right? Let's say, let's do 30 second notes. What about 16th? I want more distinct echoes. So what if I do, what if I get rid of the sustain? Oh, I don't have it turned on. That's why it's not working. All right, so I still don't care much I don't care much for the lack of kind of, there's a distinct. So let's clean it out uh, a little bit. Oh, no, oh, more comments. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. My problem, uh, Florian, my problem with sense like massive is that it gives away too much options that are difficult to understand. So the learning curve is probably really hard. Yes, that is synths like Massive, there is a very steep learning curve, which is why I ended up buckling down and purchasing uh, Centauro. Because I, I took classes with Berkeley when I was studying with them. I took classes online. I have books all over my shelves about working with synths, and I just never got the hang of them. Centauro is the first one where I'm walking away with a sense of, I can do this now. Um, it's going to take time and experience, but... I at least feel like I can do it now. I have a chance. Um, it's just a matter of building it up. Uh, currently, I only work with Personas, my Thai stock plugin in Studio One. It seems like there are far less options, but they're not that difficult to understand. That is nice. I would say everyone's got their own sense that they kind of gravitate towards. Uh, personally, I'm working with Massive because that's the one that Centurio had examples for, and I own it, and I've had it for years, just never been able to use it. Uh, Makima, hey, Tabletop Composer, do you have any programs that would help me start from zero wanting to learn composition and EDM? Okay, yes, I've got playlists, not necessarily programs. Um, I also have a book designed specifically for that, to take you from no knowledge about writing or music theory all the way to writing for orchestra. Unfortunately, that is not available at the moment. It is uh, currently being, it's in the peer review process with a big publisher that I'm that uh, I should be hearing back from them soon about like the next steps because they've said they want to publish it. I'm just waiting for like the feedback. Um, but for now, I'd say start with my Harmony for Composers playlist. All right, start with Harmony for Composers. That'll take you go one video maximum. I like to recommend one video every couple days so that you have time to take what you've learned and apply it and master it. Then uh, start with the Harmony for Composers. Then from there do the melody for composers playlist to learn about writing melodies over your chord progressions. And then finally start looking at my orchestral videos that will get you started and actually take you pretty far in terms of developing your strength as a composer in terms of being more specific for EDM. Unfortunately, if you can't tell from the stream, I am no whiz with synthesizers. These are very new to me. Um, someday I want to be very good with synths, but that day is not today, not yet. So unfortunately I would recommend you're going to have to look elsewhere if you want to learn specifically about electronic dance music. Um, uh, but the basics and, uh, non-genre specific skills of composing, such as how to command your harmonies, command your melodies, and command your arrangements, 
those I can help with. Check out my playlist that I recommended in that order, and it should help quite a bit, hopefully. Uh, so good luck. Uh, let's see here. And all of it is free here on YouTube. All right, here we go. So. Let's see here. What if I... So I what I'm feeling like now is I'm going to need a bit more of an attack transient. So something I can do for that. Oh, that's why it wasn't working. I was in the wrong one. Oh, rookie mistakes. Oh, now it's not playing at all. Why is it not playing at all? What's going on here? There's something going on. Let's make sure this is set to restart. This is also set to restart. Um, let's see here. Let's remove that. There we go. All right, so we're starting to get more of a bell sound. So now... Why am I not hearing the delays? Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. The joys of working with synths as a new beginner. Oh, let's see here. All right, I've got the delay activated, right? be so it's 50 50 that means that the echoes and the initial sound themselves should have the same they should have the same volume essentially What if I create a volume an envelope I don't like what's the damping do is it volume for it how do I get too bad the feedback isn't constant meaning it doesn't keep going uh Makima it's uh foyer is good Tamashi trying uh foyer um not sure that is so Oh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm talking about for programs. Are you talking about like I thought you were talking about like classes or material stuff. Are you talking about like software? Um, as in like a DAW or synths or sound libraries? Let me know. Yeah, I'm sorry. Did I not answer the question properly? I apologize if I didn't. Uh, let's see here. And the other right? It feels like the bell is traveling from electric. Yes. So yeah, that, I was thinking about that doing the ping pong, uh, like the left and right. That's not really what I want, necessarily. Maybe eventually. Uh, this is... Yeah, so I'm just working with the synced delay at the moment, which should... Because if I wanted the ping pong, I could... Do that kind of thing, where you hear it bounce back and forth if it stops. But that's not what I'm really going for some weird stuff going on I kind of want this kind of idea of the echoes I want it to come in loud then get quiet then build back up so it's very frustrating that the feedback isn't infinite let's increase the volume a little bit What 
if I try doing one of these? I like that idea. So how do I loop this so it goes quieter, then gets back up loud again? Because the feedback isn't infinite. But what is what does feedback in massive do? You know what? Here's what we're gonna do. Bell one. I'm going to save this as a preset. intro I'll come up with it later for now got just this intro idea and then we're gonna move on we'll start working on the melody in section number two Let's go over here, shall we? What are my notes? So, all right, so this is the piece we're working on. The big one that the vast majority of the session has been working on, that single synth that I'm stuck on. See, this is why I feel like I need to get better at synths because it's taken, what, an hour and a half, two hours trying to figure out one synth that I couldn't figure out, all right? So I feel like once I get better and I can speed things up, with creating sounds, I'm not gonna have that issue anymore. Um, but for now, I need to move on because I need to finish this entire piece, at least a, f a more functional draft of it by tonight. So on to part two. This is a moment where we have a very short brief moment where the music will be in charge. Uh, this is the highest energy of the section of the piece. I wanna create an initial feeling of excitement and awe something uh, before coming back down introduce the M-I-W motif, which that was the melody that we heard played here. Um, that's the main motif that we'll be listening to. Introduce, uh, get some goosebumps in the audience. That's what I kind of want to work with. Uh, melody bass line ostinato, 10 to 15 seconds, a very short line. So... Um, this is my sound panel and I'm working with. These are my options. Let's start working on section number two, shall we? Section two. In fact, let's start a new page. And this is how I like to start every little section of my music. Is I like to... 
Um, I like to take notes personally. That just works well for me because what it does, it helps me refocus on what I'm trying to accomplish. All right, so micro, let's start looking more about section two. How long is section two? Let's see. So it starts in measure 51 and goes to measure 58. So that's eight measures long. Measures, motions present in each section, how are they developing? So this is more about section two, since this is, um, I want sense of awe, something wondrous and fantasy-like. I want to create, I want to cause some goosebumps, which is called frisian in psychology. And yes, there has been extensive studies on what elements of music help create goosebumps. So I'll be applying some of my knowledge on that here and trying to make that work out. I want to cause some goosebumps. Um, and then back down to make room for the dialogue. All right, so we have eight measures here. And I said originally that, where is it, the great line? Um, this should be 10 to 15 seconds long. So that's eight measures is a little bit longer than that. Uh, so I'll have to be careful with that. I'll have to bring the melody back down shortly after. Uh, Florian, I love your systematic approach, like a clear concept written down before starting. I never did that, but I will definitely do that in the future. Thank you, Florian. That's a, yes, this was, again, one of those things that I just kind of uh, developed out of necessity. So I feel like I didn't write my first piece of music until like 2018. That's when I first decided, all right, I want to be a composer. Um, I'd always been passionate about music, but uh, there, there was kind of like a family tradition of being passionate for music, but then ditching it for a real job. Uh, fortunately, my dad was a great example of breaking that curse. Um, he's always kind of worked as like a, he had his day job, but he always continued working as a musician. And so great example through my life for that. Um, but so all that to say that I kind of ran away from music for a very long time. Uh, and so when I came back, I felt like I needed to give myself an edge. And with my background in psychology, especially with psychology, like psychology research, a lot of it was this idea that you have to create something that provides structure. You have to create a systematic approach that provides structure without forcing or pigeonholing any of the responses. So that's kind of what I did for my whole approach to music. I wanted to create a system that guided me and helped me be productive without pigeonholing all of my music into sounding like copy. they were copy and pasted. All right, so what does the music need to accomplish as a narrative? All right, so this moment... So thank you, Florian. I'm glad you like it. Um, let's see. Um, this moment is... In the play, this is really a moment where, for the first time, we actually realize there's a, something a bit more magical going on in the story. Again, I compare it to, like, Narnia, and the kind of thing where it goes from historical fiction to fantasy kind of thing. In Lord of the Rings, you start out with hobbits and a big battle and Sauron and the ring and all that cool stuff right off the bat. In Narnia, you don't. In Narnia, you start, uh, the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, you start in World War II London. All right? And so it's a very kind of historical fiction. And it's not until Lucy goes through the door of the wardrobe that you realize, oh, this is much more magical fantasy. So that's kind of the moment being created here is uh, where kind of the genre is finally established. All right, so this is where we finally feel, oh, this is going to be something a bit more fantasy-based. Um, it announces that this is going to be a bit more adventurous, fantasy-based, and magical. All right, so that's what I need to accomplish as a narrative, is I need to hit this moment and re reveal what's going on. All right, so the primary role, presenting, progressing, or transitioning. This is essentially me saying, like, am I presenting a theme? Does this theme need to be heard? Am I progressing a theme? It's like, am I uh, developing something we've already heard before, but bringing it in a new way? Or am I transitioning between two ideas? Uh, this is a presentation, presenting a new theme. 
Uh, this is the first time where we're really going to hear this primary theme used in the story. If there's an overture for this, we'll probably hear it in the overture. But as far as the play goes, this is the first time we're going to hear the Man in White's theme performed for the first time. So presenting the theme, Man in White's motif. All right, this is then is going to be thematic music moving into motivic. All right, so the idea between thematic, motivic, and non-motivic, this is something new for me. Uh, I'm constantly kind of addressing my processes, making shifts, growing as a composer. And so this is something where I started realizing it'd be helpful to figure this out ahead of time. And so the three categories I've come up with is thematic, meaning that there is a theme, there is a melody that I need to present. This needs to be heard. Uh, motivic means that maybe... Maybe it's not a full theme, but a basic idea needs to be appeared, all right? And so that idea is important. It needs to be underlined. So maybe that uh, uh, my piano's not playing, but uh, maybe like the first few notes of the theme have to be heard repeating later in the story. And then non-motivic means this is background music, right? This is about ambience. This is about emotion. This isn't necessarily about telling the story musically. But this one is going to be thematic. Moving into motivic, meaning that I need to right off the bat establish the theme and then kind of provide a bit more motif. After this section, it will return back into non motivic and be more ambient backdrop. Um, This is the highest energy of the piece. It needs to feel um, relatively high in energy and then come back down, which is one of the strategies for goosebumps. Uh, creating a sudden swell in volume, a sudden swell in pitch range or register, a sudden change in harmony. All of those are very useful strategies for creating go or like inspiring goosebumps in your audience. Um, this section needs to start large and then almost immediately start coming back down to make room for a dialogue. All right, so there's a bit of dialogue in the script at this point. The script has been updated. I have not read the update yet. That is by design. I want to get my ideas down first and then adjust as necessary. I had that discussion with the writer. We both agreed that was the best approach to take. Um, so in the script I have, there's a little bit of dialogue that I can go over, that the music can be louder of. Basic just reactions like, oh, wow, look at this kind of thing. But once the dialogue starts sharing information again, which is very quickly, I have to come back down. And I need to make sure that the dialogue does not compete. Um, and this texture is going to be homophonic. All right. So melody plus chordal accompaniment plus bass line. All right. So in this melody, if we kind of look at my sketch, which is a bit wide, let's bring this down. I have essentially two layers. Let's get this. I have the melody, and then I have the uh, ostinato. Oh, let's go down a little bit. Let's see. And then I have the bass line. So let's bring back up my notes again. So melody, ostinato, bass line. All right. Which layer is the foreground? Obviously, that's going to be the melody. All right. Uh, what does each role of the play? Uh, ostinato uh, creates energy while supporting the harmonic foundation. Baseline provides an anchoring point, allowing the modal harmony to have the feeling that it does. Because again, 
A minor to D major is a very modal sound. That's from A Dorian, or if we're going from D major to A minor, that's still a very modal sound because normally in D major, you have a C major, but C minor has a C minor. If it didn't, it'd be A major. Uh, I mean, A minor doesn't have C major. I don't know what I said. I'm getting tired. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, let's see here. So that just explains that. How would I want a clarity through pitch distribution? All right, so pitch distribution is a very important concept in arrangements in general. All right, so there are basically essentially two different, uh, three different registers, all right? You have an upper register, you have a middle register, and then you have a low register. All right, so at any given point, there are a couple different strategies you can have, all right? So let's, the middle register can be used at any time as the default. The low register can be, or high, uh, can be added to the low register to give more weight or power. The upper register can be added to the middle register to give more uh, a brighter sound and more tension. All right. So you've got the middle register, you can use it anytime you want. You can add the low register to create more weight. So if we have this middle C chord, and then we add octaves below that, you see how that got a little bit heavier, a little bit more presence. If we take that middle chord, and we go above it, you can see how it gets a little brighter, a little more tense. Um, on the other hand, the low register or upper registers can be used on their own to create uh, especially emotional sounds, but they quickly become fatiguing, so don't linger for too long. So the idea that I could play my melody down here. What is my melody? It's been a while since I played on piano. Um, Thing. Let's open this. So I could do the melody down here. We've got the melody originally. We could do it down here. We could go up here. And the idea of this isn't necessarily just piano. This is orchestration. Um, you can have most of your music in the upper register. That creates a very beautiful, tense, bright sound. You can have most of your arrangement in the low register. That creates a very heavy, round, dark sound. But both of them, being in the extreme ends of things, tend to be fatiguing to your audience. They lose their impact rather quickly, so you don't want to overstay your welcome. Um, another one that you can do is the low and upper registers can be used together without the middle register for extreme tension and energy all right so again we thought about how middle register on itself sounds pretty neutral you add the low register it has some weight it has some power you add the upper register it becomes brighter more tense so if you take the bottom register and the upper register it creates a combination of that heft that tension without the clarity and security of the middle register so extra tension extra energy um Likewise, you can use the middle register by itself. I said that at a point. You can use can use all three registers to create massive size and energy. But again, don't linger here too long. The same goes uh, for this one. All right, so these are the basic kind of ideas behind pitch distribution. Is how can you maintain... Uh, the kind of feel, the kind of size to your arrangement that you want. Um, of course, as you're doing a longer piece, you want to move around quite a bit. So if we look at what I did for the intro, we'll mute this one. Um, I stayed mostly in the lower register. So around like the C's an o over an octave below middle C. So C3 is, an is middle C. 
So I stayed mostly in the low register and then somewhat a little bit in the middle register, upper register. And this middle register is largely left alone. Then we need to kind of add this. So we're taking notes still, trying to figure that out. Uh, Florian, you got another comment there saying, I have the problem that my themes often sound either totally different, like totally different tracks or too similar to my previous theme. All right, so theme sounding similar isn't too big of an issue if they're in the same project. All right, so having multiple similar themes in a movie, that's kind of what you're going for. Um, but there's a lot, without being able to look at your themes, I can't tell you what the problem is. But something that can help is going to be your sound palette. All right, if you're working in a project and all of your themes sound too disjointed, too all over the place, chances are you're not using a similar sound palette. So I've talked about how in this one, I'm going to be limiting myself to uh, piano, acoustic bass, uh, my own human voice. I'll probably create some choirs out of myself and synthesizers. So I'm not really going to be using string sections. I'm not going to be using woodwinds. I'm not going to be using a drum kit or guitars. Um, and no matter how different all of my sounds get, as long as I keep around that general sound palette, no matter how different the themes are themselves, they're going to sound related. If, however, I were to have very different songs, like maybe in the first theme scene, I use this sound palette. Then scene number two, I switch to like a punk rock band. And then number three, I have a huge lush... A romantic style, period style, orchestral strings piece. Those are going to sound very disjointed. Even if it's the same theme over and over again, they won't sound related because there's no unifying force, no unifying color behind all of it. So that's what I would recommend. Start looking at how you're using your instruments across your sounds. But again, there could be other things. Without looking at your music, I won't be able to tell for certain, unfortunately. Uh, but hopefully that helps. All right, so all that, I kind of went over the idea behind pitch distribution. Um, The melody is going to be in the double bass. This runs the risk of being overpowered. I need to make sure the accompaniment remains in different registers. Um, this is also supposed to be the climax of the entire piece. I can briefly use all three registers, but then I'll want to narrow it back down again to make room for the dialogue. All right. Let's see. Florian, that makes sense. Thanks. My pleasure. All right. I'm probably not going to stay on here much longer. Uh, just because I need to take a break. Uh, I need to go refill my water bottle. I need to go for a 10 minute walk and then I need to get back in this seat to do more work. Um, so if anyone has any questions, let me know. I'm going to basically finish this. I'll probably put in the bass part and the piano part and then maybe the bass, uh, synth since I already have it. Uh, but after that, I'll probably be getting off. So uh, until I'd say, if you see the clock down here, about 430 is probably what I'll be staying till. Uh, so yeah, shoot any comments in the uh, description below if you've got them. How do you find a harmonic limitation? All right, so there's not too much, not too much harmonic material going on here. So just keep the ostinato and bass line from overlapping, and I should be good. Melodic limitation. There are two melodic ideas. The melody and ostinato 
need to be kept in separate registers. They should not overlap. This is just to keep the sound clear. The ideas of pitch distribution, harmonic limitation, and melodic limitation are all ideas you can learn more about from George Frederick McKay's book, uh, Creative Orchestration is what I think it's called. Uh, unfortunately, it's not in print anymore, so you got to find it at a library or a used bookstore. Um, but the, they're all based behind this principle of clarity in design, is what he calls it, which is basically how simple is it to listen to your music. Uh, there are more stuff you can listen to to make it your music sound complex, but at the core of it, is it too complex? Is it too difficult to pay attention to the stuff you need to pay attention to? Is it too difficult to tell what the foreground is, essentially? Uh, how will I maintain separation between each layer? This is going to be the same as the previous piece, so I'm going to put that down. Um, let's see here. So yeah, I'm just going to copy and paste. Each layer will be separate out of rhythm, particularly to pitch. I need to make sure that every single layer has a rich and distinct timbre that can sound full on its own. So, for example, I had the bass line, which was the bass, and then the synth. Oops. I need to go down more. Why does that sound? There we go. Kind of the um, bass supporting it. So this is my bass line layer. piano layer was its own distinct kind of idea. All right, so now I've got an idea. It's going through all of that, I don't know if that was helpful for you or not, for, but for me it gets my ideas running. So I know right off the bat, I want the bass to be playing this part. Um, this is the whole reason why I am so fixated on using the bass for this piece is I w I'm fascinated with the idea of a very powerful large instrument playing in a much more fragile register for that instrument that was the synth sorry uh, there's got to be a hot key or a quick shortcut for selecting my what's going on here why is it not playing? What's going on here? So is I'm playing middle C. It should be perfectly within the in range of the instrument. All right. So what's going on here? It should be, middle C is definitely within the, what's going on here? Why is there a chord being sustained on this? I don't know. Cubase is acting up now. Oh boy. Maybe I just need to reset. That's weird. I don't know what's going on. Um, hmm. I might just have to reset. The library. Um, but yeah, let's see here. Uh, Jack, are you viewing this project as an artist or as a craftsman? Both more of one than the other. All right, so fantastic question, uh, Jack. So the difference between an artist and craftsman, uh, in my understanding, is the artist is very detail oriented, trying to create something unique, trying to create something beautiful. Whereas a craftsman is trying to focus more on creating something functional. For most projects, unless I have a lot of time, I tend to approach it as a craftsman first. I need to make sure this functions. That's what I'm hired to do. This music needs to work. Once the music works, and I am confident that it does, that's when I start getting a little bit more artistic. I start putting a little bit more designs, playing with some more layers, create some more interesting sound combinations, all that cool, fun stuff. But the first priority is I don't get paid if the music doesn't work, if it doesn't function. So it's always craftsman first. Then if I have a great relationship with the director or the people that I'm working with and the time, then I start taking a more artistic approach. So hopefully that helps answer your question. Thorne, I have to say that your YouTube channel is one of the most helpful ones in order to learn more about composition. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks a lot. I especially like this Q&A while I write music for me. Thank you. I do too. This was something that was very nerve wracking for me when I first started. Because again, as you probably can tell, I'm a very structure focused person. I like to have a plan. Uh, so knowing that I was going to get on here, have no idea what I'm going to talk about and just have to write music in front of all of you lovely people was a little nerve wracking, but I'm genuinely enjoying this quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Does it work now? It does not. Why does it not work? Middle C. Middle C is definitely in range for the instrument. Um, is it transposing? I don't know. I'm gonna have to look into this. Unfortunately, with the technical difficulties, that probably means that I'm gonna have to end the stream here because I need to take a break. I'm gonna drop it an octave. And then I'm gonna have to like make this sound more realistic, all kinds of cool stuff. So yeah, yeah, my brain is fried. I need to take a break. I need to go for a walk. I need to eat. I need to do something, take my mind off of the music. And then in about an hour, I'll probably come back and do another two to three hours of work. Um, any questions? While I'm waiting for more questions to come in, I will kind of stand on my soapbox. I will say, if you want to support the channel, purchase some merch. You can sign up on Patreon. You can purchase my books, my notes, my PDFs, all the cool stuff I have on my website as well as private lessons, all right? So maybe you want to, you have a New Year's resolution of writing more music. I would be more than happy to work with you. I have limited space. Uh, so check out the website for all that information. I'm not good at doing ads. Uh, but, oh yes, if you want to participate in the raffle for a free copy of my book on uh, MIDI orchestration and making realistic MIDI mock-ups, make sure to follow me on Instagram, and follow the instructions in the post I shared earlier today about that. Uh, but yeah, that's about it. So I do not see any more comments coming in. Uh, I know there's a bit of a lag, so let's listen to this whole thing together again. And then by the time it's done, I'll call it a day for the stream. because I haven't given this mini the proper treatment. Oh well. Uh, yeah, it looks like there aren't any more questions. Thank you everyone who stopped by the stream today. This was a lot of fun as usual. Uh, I still need a topic for Tuesday's stream. So if you guys have a lesson, anything you'd like to see me teach more formally, uh, formally, why is it formally? I don't know. Um, formally, yes. If you'd like to see an actual lesson about something, let me know. Shoot me an email, comment on Instagram, comment on this video. Let me know. I'd be happy to put together the lesson plan for that and discuss that in Tuesday's lesson. But for now, I will see you in the next video, my friends. Keep studying, keep working hard, and keep writing new music. Have a beautiful day, people, and Happy New Year to everyone who's going to be celebrating. Have a great day. Bye-bye.